Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now at the turn of the century, Intel and AMD entered into a race to see who could release the first one gigahertz desktop CPU. And I remember buying my first CPU, my first PC with a one gigahertz CPU from AMD, of course single core back in those days, and it was great, it was an exciting time. However, it did underline and reinforce a false idea, which is that megahertz is the most important thing about a CPU design. In fact, it's not, because for example, it's more important how many instructions can be executed for every one of those megahertz. And that gives us the phrase instructions per cycle. So what are instructions per cycle and are they important for today's modern CPU designs? Well, let me explain. Now, before we jump into this, I just want to say this is a quite complicated topic. Now, I've written an article that you'll find over at the androidauthority.com website, which really will be a good reference to back up this video. So if you don't understand something, you can rewatch the video, obviously, but do head over to androidauthority.com and read the article, because maybe that will help. If you want to ask me questions, then I would suggest you go over to the androidauthority.com forums, because there we can have more liberty to discuss freely. I don't think that all the questions could be answered here in the YouTube comments though I will try if you ask them. So let's get cracking. Now back in the days of 8-bit microprocessors the way a processor would work was like this. It would fetch an instruction which of course was in main memory. It would bring it into the CPU. It would look at the instruction to see what it was. Let's say load zero into a register. Once it worked out what it had to do it actually do that thing. It would execute it. And then finally, the results of that operation would need to be written back into the status registers in the CPU. And that gave us four stages, fetch, decode, execute, and write back. Now, back then, processes were generally sequential, which meant that it would fetch it, decode it, execute it, and write back, and then it would go back and fetch the next one, and so on and so on. That meant it took four clock cycles to do one instruction. So the instructions per clock cycle was in fact a quarter because it needed four stages, four stages to make that instruction happen. Now, of course, one of the things that Henry Ford is famous for is inventing the idea of the mass production line when he built his Model T Ford car. Rather than taking a car from the beginning and working on it all the way through to the end, he had lots of cars on a production line that were being worked at at each station. Now that idea can actually be applied to processors. Rather than doing fetch, decode, execute, write back, and then go back to fetch, decode, actually, while one instruction is being decoded, another one can be fetched. And then when that goes further down the line, that same instruction is being executed, there's one being decoded, and there's one behind that being fetched. And then finally, there could be one during the write back stage, one in the execution stage, one in the decode stage, and one in the fetch stage. So in fact, there could be four different instructions in the pipeline going along at the same time. Now that means every clock cycle, something is coming off the end of the production line, off the write back stage. And that therefore gives you an instructions per cycle of one, because every clock cycle something is happening. And this idea can be extended even further. If one of the stages is particularly time consuming, then it can be broken down into smaller stages. So rather than having four stages, you might break down the uh, decode into two separate stages or into three separate stages, or you might break down the execution into three separate stages. And therefore you might grow your pipeline. In fact, what they call these super pipeline CPUs, which most modern CPUs are, might have 11 stages. The Cortex-A73 has 11 stages in its pipeline. The Cortex-A72 from ARM has 15 stages in its pipeline. Now, although we like to think of programs as being linear sequences of instructions, in fact, they aren't. If you just had a simple app in your hand and you pressed on one button, then the program must jump off to a place to do one thing. If you press the other button, it will jump off to a place and do a different thing. In fact, even a simple loop is in fact going down, jumping back, going down, jumping back until a loop is completed. And this branching causes a problem for CPUs. Because imagine you've got this 15 stage pipeline that's processing all these instructions that are ready to be executed. And then you find out that the last instruction said, well, jump off somewhere else and do something completely different. Now, all these instructions that are in the pipeline are rubbish that you can't use them. And so the pipeline has to be emptied 
and then it has to be filled up again with the latest uh, instructions. Now that's called a branch penalty. Every time it happens, the CPU has to do all this work which wastes time and lowers the performance. So therefore, CPUs include a technology called branch prediction. Particularly if you think about a loop, every time it goes around a loop, it might do this loop, let's say, 100 times. Well, for 100 times, every time it hits that branch, it goes back up and does the same code again. So if there was a clever bit of circuit, you'd say, what are the chances of these sets of instructions being executed next? The branch predictor would say, yep, I think there's a good chance, and it goes ahead. And that reduces the number of times that the, uh, the pipeline has to be emptied. Now, an interesting thing about the execute stage is that not all instructions take the same amount of time to execute. You can imagine loading zero into a register is actually pretty simple for a CPU. However, multiplying two floating point numbers is probably going to be a bit more complicated. So therefore, they get a bottleneck because if the CPU says, right, now multiply these two floating point numbers and then after that load zero into this register, well, that load zero into the register has to wait until all those floating point operations are done. But there's a thing called instruction level parallelism, ILP, which means that actually if the CPU detects the next instruction doesn't have anything to do with the previous one, so multiply these two numbers together is fine, load zero into this register is not related to that, then actually it can dispatch, it can say, well, do this load while the floating point operation is still going on. Now that means now that the instructions per cycle has actually gone up, it's greater than one, at its peak it can be two, and in normal running operation it's somewhere between because not all instructions can be ran in a parallel fashion. But there's more. What if the CPU could look at the instructions that are coming and reorder them so that it executes them in an optimum fashion, so that it has a load store operation going on at the same time as an integer add operation, at the same time as a floating point multiplication uh, instruction, so that all parts of the CPU are being used simultaneously to bump up the parallelism to bump up the ILP. Well, that's called out of order execution. Now, not all CPUs are out of order execution CPUs. For example, the Cortex A53 and the Cortex A35 are in order. They don't juggle around the instructions to try and optimize the execution. And the reason for that is that out of order execution requires a lot of clever circuitry on the CPU to do all that scanning, to work out what's coming up next, to check whether it can really do that without mucking up the program and changing the results. And therefore, that requires more silicon and it requires more power because that uh, circuitry is always on, it's always being powered, it's never being shut down because every time an instruction is executed, it needs to be active to work out what's going on. So the Cortex A53, the Cortex A35 are in order and therefore they're much more low power CPUs. Now things like the Cortex A57, the Cortex A72 and the Cortex A53 are all out of order CPUs and therefore they have that extra circuitry but of course they have that also that gain in performance. Now I've talked about pipelines, how long they are. Now in sort of technical speak, CPU designers talk about the depth. How, what's the depth of your pipeline? So that's the depth and then how many instruction units you have for executing the instructions, floating point, load, branch, and so on, that's called the width. So you have a width and a depth. And these are two parameters that the uh, CPU designers can play with. How long do they want the pipeline? How wide do they want the dispatch to be? And of course, these things have an impact on the performance of the CPU. Now, when you come to having a wide CPU with lots of dispatch units, lots of execution units that can do lots of instructions in parallel, the problem is, is you need to look how far ahead can you look to find the next instructions to keep all those little execution units busy. And that's called the instruction window. How far ahead can it keep searching to see what's available to stuff and those execution is out of order, of course, because it's doing it out of order. It's scanning ahead to see what it can find. Now, at the bigger the instruction window, the greater chance of having a high ILP, high levels of parallelism, because you can keep all those execution units busy. The smaller the instruction window, then there's less chance of doing that. So if you have a smaller instruction window, it's probably better for the CPU to have a narrower, not so wide execution stage. Now, you would think, great, well then why don't we just have really wide and really deep CPUs and we can have lots of 
uh, instruction parallelism and everything is great. The problem is, first of all, computer programs aren't necessarily parallel by their nature. There's a wall that you hit at where you say, well, actually, the idea of a computer uh, program is that one thing has to happen and then another thing has to happen. Think about making a cake. Maybe you can add the ingredients in a different order sometimes, but in other cases, you have to do things in a certain order, otherwise it's not going to work. You can't put an egg in the oven and then crack it and put it in a bowl to add the flour. You've got to do things in a certain order. So that's called the ILP wall. There's a parallelism wall, a limit to how much parallelism can happen. There's also a problem with very wide CPUs with a big instruction window, and that is the internal timing is very tricky. So though you do have the benefits of having a greater IPC instructions per cycle, actually putting that together is quite hard. So let's look at some of the CPUs from ARM and Qualcomm and Samsung and Apple to see if we can work out how they're designing their CPUs. So let's look at the clock frequencies of these CPUs. The Cortex-A72 can be clocked up to 2.5 gigahertz. The Cortex-A73 can be clocked up to 2.8 gigahertz and the Samsung Mongoose core can be clocked up to 2.6 gigahertz. So these are all in the same ballpark. But if you look at, for example, Apple's A9 processor, that runs at only 1.8 gigahertz. So that's quite a, a big difference. In fact, the previous generation, the A8, only ran at 1.5 gigahertz. And if you look at Cryo core, that runs at 2.1 gigahertz. So it's kind of somewhere there in the middle. But yet, we can all safely say that the performance of these CPUs are all in the same ballpark. There is not a big difference between the 1.8 gigahertz Apple and a 2.5 gigahertz A72. In fact, maybe the Apple is better in some situations. So they're all in the same area of performance, and yet they do have different clock speeds, significantly different clock speeds. So what can we work out from that? Well, what we can work out is that ARM and Samsung are going with the idea of a narrower CPU, probably quite deep in its pipeline, but narrower and a higher clock speed. So in this case, the clock speed is very important because it's the clock speed that's giving you the overall performance. Now, at the other end of the scale, we seem to have Apple who are working on a very wide CPU with a very big instruction window trying to do lots of out of order speculation about what can instructions can be executed next and because that's complicated they can only actually reach a speed of 1.8 gigahertz 1.5 gigahertz in the previous generation and therefore that gives us the idea of the design of their processor however the performance the overall performance is actually coming out in the same area as these 2.5 2.6 and 2.8 CPUs. And it looks like the cryo uh, processor from Qualcomm is somewhere in the middle, 2.1 gigahertz, but yet its performance is the same as or even better than the Cortex-A72 and the Mongoose M1. That's a discussion for a different way about the relative performance, but they're all in the same area. So what can we tell from that? Apple and Qualcomm seem to be going with wide, lots of uh, uh, execution units and a great amount of out of order speculation going on to try and get these execution units running uh, full capacity, as much level instruction level parallelism as possible. And it seems that ARM and Samsung are going with out of order still, but maybe with a slightly narrower execution stage and trying to get that extra performance through uh, the clock speed. And so here we have two different philosophies. Now, which philosophy is better? Well, at the moment, they're pretty much neck and neck. One is better than the other, then the next generation, the other one's better than that, and it kind of swings and roundabouts. So there you have it. There is instructions per cycle. So don't compare a 1.8 gigahertz Apple A9 with a 2.8 gigahertz Cortex A73 and say, oh, well, it's clearly what's going on here. It's a bit more complicated than that. Instructions per cycle. Well, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. As I said, please do talk in the comments below about IPC, about process design, but really better head over to the Android Authority forums where we can maybe have a better conversation. Don't forget to download the Android Authority uh, app because then you can get access to all of our news and features directly on your mobile phone. But also don't forget to check out androidauthority.com because we are your source for all things Android.